Um, welcome to this forum hosted by Green Left and Socialist Alliance about the people's resistance in Myanmar and the campaign to target the junta's ties uh, in Australia. Uh, we are hosting this forum on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And now we're very proud to be hosting this uh, important discussion about the current state of the people's resistance in Myanmar, uh, which advanced in earnest in February 2021 when the Myanmar military mounted a, a coup. Now, since then, the military have conducted a war of terror against Myanmar civilians, uh, but the resistance uh, actually controls a significant portion um, of the country, uh, which I was surprised about. You don't really hear much about what's happened in, in Myanmar since, since the coup actually happened. Um, so with us tonight, we have two leaders of the Solidarity Movement here in Australia. Mon Zin is a founding member of the Global Myanmar Spring Revolution. And Tasneem Rock is a pro-democracy advocate of Karen and Scottish descent and a campaign manager with Myanmar Campaign Network. On the 29th of October, it's going to be a thousand days since the military coup and then the resistance is still very strong. A lot of the people, especially in Australia, people don't know where is the country, what does Myanmar mean? Every time I said, oh, I'm from Myanmar, oh, what's that? Myanmar? Mia? Like, you know, and I have to revert back to Burma. I think, oh, Burma. We know Burma because um, Burma um, was ruled by you know, British back in the day, in the 1800s. Myanmar is in actual fact, the largest country in mainland Southeast Asia. And it shares a border with, you know, Thailand, Laos, China, India, and Bangladesh. It's very importantly located because it's guarded by the Bengal Sea, the Bay of Bengal, and then Indian Ocean. And Myanmar also have a lot of ethnic groups and very diverse, and the majority of them are, you know, obviously Burmese, Shan, Karens, Arakanis, Mon, Chins, and Gachins. There are about 54 million population in Myanmar, but 48 million are practicing Buddhists. So huge majority, like, you know, 90% of people are Buddhism. And oftentimes, you know, obviously, the military use that to divide and rule. Um, so Myanmar is also very rich in jade, like the north part of the Myanmar is actually uh, have a lot of jade mines that we imported to um, China. It's very pivotal um, and it generated a lot of foreign revenue and you know in the middle part of Myanmar where more go very near to Mandalay they have a lot of gem mines such as very famous Burmese rubies are actually mined from there. Yeah. Myanmar is very rich in, you know, fossil fuel resources. So we have a lot of, um, you know, natural gas that um, we are, well, during the, you know, like when the coup was happening, the gas were actually exported out of uh, mine by Chevron, the company like Chevron and Total Energies. But now, um, both Chevron and Total Energy has exited, exited out of Myanmar and the Thai state-owned enterprise PTTEP is now mining the natural resources. And, you know, other numerous uh, mineral resources that Myanmar is very rich of, um, including the ag very rich agricultural land as well. Like, British has slowly occupied, colonized Myanmar from 1824 and uh, from the 1888 is the complete um, um, colonizations of you know Burma happened from that 1888 to 1948 um, British colonization lasted through three anglo Burmese wars like the creation of like it, we went through many stages so Myanmar but like there's a creation of Burma because you know British peoples are very ignorant in when it comes to diversity of the ethnic um, groups that are present in Myanmar. So majority of them, like they refer to themselves as Burma, Burma. So they just thought, oh, okay, so we're just gonna name the country Burma. So Burma has become a province of British India. And then later down the track, it was independently administered by colonies. So they separated from British India to just Burma. 
And then finally in 1948, it has um, gained a full independence. So British occupied Myanmar, why? Because they dreamt of like, you know, um, they dreamt of laying down the golden road to China mm. through Burma, mm -hmm. but that was never realized. British has discovered they are like discovered the rich resources in Myanmar, um, especially the rich agricultural land. And during you know British rule, Burma rice was highly demanded international wise. So after Burma has gained the full independence, they have a parliament and the parliament MPs are being elected by the people. So you can say that they are a democratic, democratic country. They were practicing democracy. And then in 1962, um, the military coup happened. General Ne Wing has occupied, like, you know, like they did a coup. He um, dubbed, that's right, he dubbed the title Pathway to Socialism. We're going to do the nationalizations of, you know, all of the, um, uh, you know, the capitals and assets and properties that um, are privately owned are uh, being confiscate, confiscated by, you know, the group that led by General Nguyen. Win. Because of the poverty, 1988 uprising happened. And, you know, during that uprising, it's estimated to be 3,000 people were being killed by the security forces of the military. And there were like state law and order restoration council were established. Mm -hmm. There are many generals that are trying to, um, uh, you know, they said trying to bring back the peace and security into the territory. So there's many change in hand happen until General Danshui has came into power. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the military government continued to rule up until 2011. And you know um, the president Deng Sein, um and his associates and then the group that supporting the roadmap to democratize the Myanmar happened. And then in 2015, the military junta were officially dissolved, and then the general election happened. At the time when General Ne Win did the coup, um, Myanmar was Asia's most prosperous country, but through the corruptions, right, and, um, you know, through the corruptions, through um, the capitalism, but, to, you know, like, like only people who are associated with the General Ne Wins and, you know, um, his strongest supporter can actually gain the benefit of, you know, um, luxury services you know uh, the government um, employees are you know uh, under the salary which is you know within the threshold that never changed even though the inflation has going up um, general Nguyen went through so many wives he's a womanizer cool. and through that he always woo his wives and you know like you know, all these luxury items he lives like live like they are king and queen and you know, they have a lot of mates and servants who are around them. Um, so, so, and also because of, um, I believe there might have been sanctions, but I could be wrong. Um, and because of that, um, maybe he wasn't able to do a lot of trades, like, you know, internationally, maybe. But even if he's doing any trade, that they will not go to the people they would just go into their own copper. So that's how they are corrupted and then the Burma economy has dwindled um, since 1962. So um, Burma has always looked to China um, because of the, you know, during the military rule as well, always looked to China because there are a lot of um, sanctions that are imposed onto Burma. Um, the three finger salute, so the three fingers salute, the Hunger Games three finger salute has become a symbol. It's really popular among the Gen Z. We love it. Um, DMSR use it as a, um, a bloody, bloody three finger strike. Pretty much what we want is justice and accountability on what's happening in Myanmar and you know all these atrocities that the junctures are junk 
committing. Okay, well, thank you. Is that the end? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so we'll, we'll sure. go straight on to Tash. Sure. <laughs> um, well, thank you, everyone, also for, for having us both here. Um, I also pay respects to the traditional owners of the land that we're um, living on today. So, um, I am one of two campaign managers for Myanmar Campaign Network. Um, Myanmar Campaign Network was uh, formed just after the coup in um, 2021, um, and it comprises of uh, Myanmar diaspora organisations, uh, human rights organisations, international NGOs, uh, some trade unions, and um, faith-based organisations as well. I'm really happy um, that Mon gave you um, kind of like an overview and, and a history. Um, so, like she said, this is one of the most amazing times in the history of M Myanmar. So there has been a history of military repression and violence and also a history of uprising. This is the first time in Myanmar's history since independence that this uprising, this revolution has been sustained for so long. So it's a really exciting time uh, to be in. Mon showed you that, um, that, uh, well, that picture from uh, uh, the video um, from the first day of uh, the the coup d'etat. A couple of days after that, the civil disobedience movement started, and it was started uh, firstly by healthcare workers, uh, and they were joined by people from all walks of life, um, workers from, uh, you know, the medical profession, <coughs> railway workers, um, uh, garment workers. So uh, factory workers were mobilised, and a lot of those were women as well, and they all refused to work under military rule. And the civil disobedience movement was uh, a key factor in stopping the military from, from a whole ta a takeover over of the country because they shut down infrastructure. So in terms of banking, uh, transport, um, healthcare, they, um, they played a really significant part and still do. So over 200,000 people um, participated and are still participating, are still striking. Um, and... Uh, you know, much to their, their um, I guess, detriment as well, because participating in the civil disobedience movements means they are targeted for arrests. Um, it means that it's very difficult to, for them to get further work. And uh, it also, in, in some cases, they have had to flee. So they either are displaced internally or they've crossed borders where they're uh, living as refugees and also can't work. And so. There's uh, a lot of uh, work by the diaspora uh, to support those people who are still striking. So in terms of sending funding, sending money, but also in retraining and helping them to start businesses as well. So in the beginning, um, millions of people took to the street all over the country. Um, women uh, had a very large part to play in the protest as um, did the LGBTQI plus community. Um, you can see there in the left and the middle photo um, there's uh, sarongs, lungis, hanging from, uh, from, from wires because the military are very chauvinistic and very superstitious and they believe it's bad luck to, um, to walk under them. And it was actually a really effective way, you know, in, in the very beginning to, to stop, stop them in, in some respects. So in the beginning as well, um, we had a lot of youth um, and again, people from all walks of life using really creative ways to protest and the youth as well have... Um, played a really big part in the civil disobedience movement and the pro-democracy movement. And again, I guess that's a generation that has had lived for, you know, a decade or so uh, in, a, in a democratic country and they did, definitely didn't want to, to live again under uh, military boots. On February 9th, not that long after the uh, protest started, uh, the military were authorised to use lethal force. Um, and they, they began to have uh, pretty severe civilian casualties. It didn't stop the protests, but um, obviously as time has gone on, the forms of protest have, have changed significantly. Protests today, and, and Mon did speak um, somewhat about some of the different protests that have been happening internationally. Um, they are still creative, but oftentimes they'll use things like flash mobs. In areas of the country that aren't under military rule, they're very openly out in the streets protesting every day. Um, they're obviously pro protesting on social media. 
and you can see the silence strike in Yangon. They did the opposite of filling the streets. They refused to enter the streets and they basically shut down cities by, by not, not being participating in civic life. So um, There's a really great organisation, it's called uh, the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar and they did uh, some, um, some, some research into it. And what they found, found is the military only controls about 15 to 20% of the country, mm. which is not very much. And the rest of it is either controlled by ethnic um, armed organisations or ethnic resistance organisations or under control of the legitimate government, the, which is the national unity government. Mm. So there's actually a large part of the country mm. that is still contested. Um, because the military only controls that small part of the country, what they are doing now, they can't win on the ground. What they're doing now is they're utilising airstrikes and heavy artillery. So um, as of the 23rd, you can see over 4,000 people have been killed and over 25,000 people have been arrested. And that is just the verified numbers. So most likely the death count and um, arrests and disappearances is, is probably 10 times that amount. Prior to the coup, there was about between 300 and 400,000 people displaced internally because of um, previous conflict and, and natural disasters, and now it's over 1.9 million. And um, UNHCR uh, assesses that 18 million are in need of humanitarian aid. I'll go to the next slide. Um, so, a huge amount of people have been arrested. Um, about over 19,000 of them are still incarcerated. The life of a political prisoner is very dire. So even from arrest, obviously there's violence when you are arrested. They'll go through an interrogation um, process where they'll be um, either subjected to physical or, or mental torture, beaten, sexual assaults, rapes, this kind of thing. For LGBTQI plus um, prisoners, they will have very specific forms of torture that, um, you know, in terms of um, abusing them. Inside the prison, uh, the conditions are bad, it's overcrowded, they often don't have access to adequate medical care, adequate food. Uh, prisoners are often transported very far away from their families as well, so they don't have a network of support for people who can come to give them um, things that they need. One thing that also happens is that when the military can't find the people that they're targeting, they will take their families hostage. Mm. So children and uh, elderly fam family members, even babies have been um, put into prison as hostages when they can't find the people that they're targeting. So since the beginning of the coup, um, we've seen 22 massacres. Um, and there have been continued war crimes and crimes against humanity. This is a recent one that happened this month in Kachin State, uh, where the military bombed an IDP, an internally displaced persons camp, and then fired heavy artillery. So 29 people died and 57 people were injured. And obviously, as you can see, the, 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 um, the camp was completely destroyed as well. Um, and this, this, these kind of atrocities have been happening for the last two years, but also remembering that it had the, the country has a history of repression and these kind of crimes have been happening all throughout the country for the last 70 years, particularly in those ethnic areas. One thing that did happen um, was that trade unions were outlawed. So um, workers now don't have the right to, um, to, to gather. They don't have any re um, recourse if there's any um, any uh, wrongdoings in their place of work. So there's uh, a lot of uh, workplace abuses happening now because of that. These are um, four uh, trade unionists and organisers who have been uh, arrested in some way. The, the first um, gentleman, uh, Tetnin Aung, he was arrested and sentenced to, um, I think it was 20 years hard labour, but he was actually released this year. But when he was released, his family went to the police station to pick him up only to find that he'd been re-arrested and now he's been disappeared. So there is hope. So when um, the military raided the, com uh, the, the capital, Naypyidaw, and they arrested the majority of the civilian government, some of that government did escape. And so they have formed uh, a, 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 the legitimate government, which is the committee representing Piron Su Pluto, which is the, the union parliament. 
Um, so they um, also formed uh, the National Unity Consultative Council, which is a very diverse group of um, uh, women's organisations, strike coordination committees, and other ethnic and ethnic um, organisations as well. And they formed uh, the National Unity Government, which consists of uh, democratically elected officials, representatives of ethnic groups, minor parties, and civil disobedience movement leaders. Um, and you know they have a, a plan and a pathway towards federal democracy. Obviously, um, they're they're being hunted, so they are, have dispersed. Some of them are outside of the country. Some of them are in ethnic controlled areas, and um, they obviously have to um, work very covertly. Uh, and under those circumstances, I think they've done a, an amazing job to 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 maintain this for you know over two years. So, in terms of international action. Uh, the US, UK, EU and Canada and others have sanctioned 179 individuals and 152 entities. Um, Australia um, in February this year sanctioned uh, 16 uh, individuals. Uh, that's in addition to five individuals they sanctioned in 2018 um, in regards to the Rohingya genocide and two entities. So even though that's, that is a, a pretty impactful um, like action that we took earlier this year, we are still very far behind what the rest of the world is doing. It's only 6% of international sanctions actions that, that, are, that, are, that have taken place. What um, Myanmar Campaign Network are calling for, and indeed I think the people of Myanmar and the Myanmar diaspora around the world, is calling for uh, stronger sanctions and um, more coordinated sanctions. So like Mon was saying, um, Myanmar is extremely rich in natural resources and the Myanmar junta relies on that foreign revenue to buy the, the, the jets and the helicopter gunships. They don't, they don't manufacture those um, inside the country. So we're calling for sanctions on those state-owned enterprises, also on the aviation fuel supply chain, the banking sector, as Mon mentioned, arms manufacture and procurement, and also obviously on high-ranking military officers and, and ministers. We've, we've sanctioned 21 of them, but there's plenty to go. All of those state-owned enterprises, their bank accounts are under the control of the junta at the moment. Um, and as I said, they rely on that foreign revenue. I think I actually covered this just now, but yes, <laughs> the foreign revenue is used to buy the heavy artillery and the, and the jet. So there is other impact as well, and I know that um, you're also concerned about um, ecological impact, ecological um, disaster as well. So since the coup, there has been a, a surge in illegal logging, uh, which has contributed to deforestation. Um, there's also been a surge in uh, rare earth mining, um, which is highly pollutant to both land and um, waterways. And we're also seeing an increased criminalisation um, of the economy, so a rise in human trafficking, drug production, and also scam centres. So because the, the country is in, is in such um, turmoil and unrest, we're actually finding that people are being smuggled into the country from other countries such as Laos and Cambodia to work uh, under duress in scam centres. So it's a, it's a massive um, thing that's popped up and those scam centres are under the control of the border guard which is uh, under the military. One interesting thing we found this year is that Australia is still importing goods that are funding the junta through state-owned enterprises. So timber and wood products, pearls and gems, and bizarrely enough, arms and ammunition. So all of the legal sale of any of those products um, goes through state-owned enterprises. Um, and so that is um, one uh, issue that we're posing to our government because uh, obviously Australia should be doing everything that it can to prevent any kind of foreign, foreign revi revenue sorry, from reaching the junta. What happened in 1988, there were a lot of boycott you know, campaigns. Um, there were comprehensive like sanctions campaign, apart from the fact that they didn't sanctions the you know, Myanmar oil and gas enterprises because you know, obviously, um, it was U.S. national interest because Chevron was trying to venture into Burma. Um, so things have changed. The global economic setting has changed, and then people are much more um, uh, have a lot more information and then awareness on how one sanctions can impact. People are much more, um, you know, like 
people have started to have an open mind about how military has been oppressing towards the minority ethnic community, like especially Rohingya, like a lot of people have come out and said that, oh my God, you know, they, they, they were wrong before. Like they were always about the divide and rule that military has been practicing, right? Buddhism, Islam, so they create a lot of Islamophobia. After the 2015 general elections, everyone is looking at Burma as an opportunity to just go there and, um, you know, do more business. A lot of ventures are waiting there. Um, a lot of Korean, um, you know, garment factories were set up, um, you know, H&M and, you know, a lot of, uh, yeah, the flagship stores and things like that, they have a garment factories there. Mm. And those labor forces, um, the, like if the sanctions were to impose, they worry that the girl's gonna be out on the street, they're gonna become a prostitute, you know, they, they worry, there's a lot of arguments around it. But what um, they didn't see is the best interest for Myanmar is look at, like listen to the people's voices. They're doing the civil disobedience movement. The transport workers are going out on the railway road and then they are lying on the, you know, like in front of, they, they are actually persuading like their fellow workers to join their movement. So a lot of health worker has quit um, hospital, which was such a huge dilemma because, you know, like they have an ethic and moral obligation but they have done so, like they just go, okay, I'm not gonna go to hospital anymore and work for the military. Mm. I'm gonna do the civil disobedient movement. So, so it happened, but, but because of the globalization, because of a lot of information, there are, there are still debate, like today, even though the International Labor Organization has um, published a report on how much violations are happening to the unions and then the laborers in, and the workforces in Burma, um, you know, people are still arguing against whether or not um, Myanmar should be comprehensively sanctioned. Mm. Yeah. I was actually just going to um, supplement what Mom was saying about like the citizens like boycotting the, the junta because they're also internally boycotting products that, the, that are military owned because the the junta has business has two massive um, military conglomerates that have a, at least 106 subsidiaries in in lots of different um, uh, sectors. So everything from tour, like tourism and hospitality to beer to you know those uh, to um, manufacturing and mining all of that sort of stuff. So they've been like boycotting um, beer. Campaigns. Yeah, yeah, boycotting. There's a whole list of things that people just refuse to buy, even to the point where. They sometimes they boycott soccer games because the team is uh, associated with the military. Mm. They even did things like um, refusing to pay pay their electricity bills. Um, so really, kind of really cool things. Oh, as that well. was very cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than divestment, one of the things that the um, Myanmar people of Myanmar were asking for is actually um, to. Uh, rather than to pay the revenue, to put the revenue into escrow. So they're not asking necessarily for companies to leave Myanmar, they're just asking them to freeze the, the flow of um, revenue to the state-owned enterprises until it's under a civilian government. One thing that is interesting is that Australia's Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Future Fund, does have investments in a lot of the companies that, that are still um, extracting, exporting gas. From Myanmar. So, um, one of the moves that Future Fund has done is they actually um, trying to pass a bill through the parliament to um, uh, to bypass like for the Future Fund to bypass the Freedom of Information Act so that means that you know like <laughs> activists like us or you know um, any company will not be able to request um, you know from them to see which company they are invested in um, yeah, luckily we were able to stop, put a stop to it, like before, you know, yeah, it went through the parli parliament yeah. hearing, so that was good. In terms of illegal logging, like that's a massive issue um, in itself, and one thing that um, I think it was the Environmental Investigation Agency, they found that 80% um, of, 80% 80, 80 of timber from Myanmar is potentially illegal, and like I said, isn't that crazy? It, there's there's very um, poor supply chain um, kind of evidence, so it's very hard to tell whether you're buying uh, timber that's been logged illegally or or not. The U.S. K 
Canada, EU and UK have sanctioned Myanmar timber enterprise. Um, and one thing that we're finding is that um, importers are getting around the sanctions um, because they're purchasing logs from, they, 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 the um, documentation is forged. So they'll be buying the logs from India or from M Malaysia, um, but they're still importing them into the US and into the EU. A lot of the a lot of illegal uh, logging in Myanmar it gets exported to China it gets exported to India. The our our imports from China sorry I don't know how to say this properly. Uh, we are the largest. China is the source country for the, how do the I say largest this? source country for our imported. timber yeah. imports. Yeah. There you go. So it's also highly likely that that we're getting a lot of illegal uh, timber from Myanmar through China as well. <laughs> How can we make this campaign successful? Because if they are actually presenting the forged document from India as if it's they are legally importing, you know, timber mm -hmm. into Australia, like, can you file those company with OECD? Like, how do you, how do you, how can you stop? Like, <laughs> thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. I think I think at the moment the the laws that um. The laws that apply to um, the imports of logging is actually being reviewed, and I think that I think that there is fines that if you're found to have imported, um, like obviously companies are supposed to do their due, due diligence and they're supposed to be like, yeah, I know the exact supply chain. Either they're not doing that, or um, or that supply chain has it's been forged. I think they're reviewing those laws right now. There is fines that if you have been mm -hmm. fined, but I mean, it's they're not they're quite negligible, really. I mean, yeah. Also, to answer about the, you know, Australia involvement with the um, the gas revenue, how can Australia, you know, as a whole, can prevent um, the gas revenue flowing to Burma? It's very simple. Like Australian government can impose sanctions to Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, even though, like. You know, I said earlier that Australian companies are not involved in exploration of the gas directly, but doing so, like if Australia were to impose sanctions on Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, which we dubbed it as Moji, M O G E, Moji, saying that Moji is actually now blacklisted and the Australian government, and therefore Moji or any um, payments or any accounts that are associated with Moji are flowing directly or indirectly or any paying agent will not be able to use Australian dollar, will not be able to use Australia bank, like financial institutions. So this is what we have been advocating to Australian government and also to the US government. If US were to sanction Moji, it would be a huge, huge success. And then, you know, um, there will be a, like, a lot of life losses could have been prevented. So because of the military's divide and rule for their capitalism and for their corruptions and, you know, for them to be able to, um, you know, cough out all the people's money into their own pocket, yes, and um, this has become a big issue um, where um, Rohingya people are living in Arakan because Arakanese people are also Buddhist and they practice Buddhist um, stronger than um, people who practice Buddhists in the capital city can sometimes be viewed as you know a bit more modest compared to the Arakanese and they also you know because Arakanese are also the minority ethic and then obviously they have been suppressed and military oftentimes divert the attention for them to gain the independence instead you know you have a problem with those people you know divide and rule um, also, Arakanis, um, like, has recently gained, um, you know, control of the territory largely in, in that, um, you know, like, um, the, the map that I was sharing, um, the west side of Burma, next to the Bangalore Sea. So in the Bangalore Sea, yes, there are oil refineries that are happening. Um, there is a oil refinery um, that produces um, uh, at least $1.5 billion of military revenue per annum, uh, largely are produced in the Bangalore Sea. 
and um, there are the gas pipelines that um, you know that that has been um, constructed um, the gas pipeline to go to China so the China state-owned enterprise has been buying the gas revenue from Burma as well so they call it CNUOC uh, recently Arakani has gained a, like you know um, Arakani has also resisted against the military and China um, has supported them a lot because of the interest of the gas pipeline that are going inside their country. So they're really worried that it might get damaged or something could have happened. So through, um, through China, they have a connection to be able to buy weapons and you know guns and you know bullets and etc. And they were able to build their people resistant forces. But Arakani sit, still sit, um, uh, like Arakani's cannot we cannot really dub our Khanis army we call it AA as an alliance to the people resistant forces yet they do help they do help every now and then like you know they do help and support each other but we cannot call them as an alliance yet sure. so the national unity government you know now includes representatives from various ethnic groups you've explained the Arakanese not quite in the same camp but uh, the, the Rohingya are not in it as well. Has there been any attempts to draw uh, them into national unity government? Absolutely, because for me, um, as an activist, I see how um, you know Myanmar politician has evolved. Um, so, you know, a lot of the um, new ministers, like that are leading the NUG ministries. They are fresh blood, I would say. They understand, um, you know, what does it mean, um, human rights violation, um, what, you know, the people are asking for. Very much they listen to people. So we have um, NUG, National Unity Government, has a ministry called Human Rights. Um, not a lot of government do. Uh, they have a human rights ministry and then the human rights minister has seen the need for the Rohingya, like consolidation, like, you know, to stand in solidarity with um, Rohingya people. So he has um, uh, hired a deputy minister who is of the Rohingya descendant. So I think that says a volume. They're trying to balance um, diversity in the parliament. Also, I believe that the NUG um, have, so in terms of the Rohingya genocide, they have, is it, what's the right word? Acceded to? No. Sub submitted submitted to? to? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, to, to the Rome Statute um, for the International Criminal Court for the crimes against the Rohingya um, to be tried, so that those that have committed those crimes to be tried. So, you know, I think they have made a commitment. Yeah, they have. Um, with the military divide and rule, they're doing, you know, like all this propaganda for Buddhism is that females are regarded as, you know, a low rank compared to male. So, you know, like a longi is like um, a sarong, mm -hmm. the sarong that we wear. And if the sarong is on the clothing line, <laughs> men are not supposed to go underneath, right? <laughs> they have to go over it. <laughs> so there is this um, campaign that um, the feminist, you know, like a the female uh, Gen Z has came up is that the military were stationed like trying to control their uh, suburb or things like that. So in the night time, they quickly go over the tank, the military tank, and then they put the wiring across the tank, <laughs> and then they put their laundry on it, and then they run away. And also they took a picture, of course, and then, you know, like we just laugh at it. So, um, and also there is the campaign for flower, like a flower campaign act campaign. <laughs> so flower campaigns is like people who can't go out because they're very scared of military. Like if you go out on the street, if you talk about, you know, three, like even if you do the three finger salute, you're gonna get arrested, porter, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't know what your fate is going to be. If you've been arrested and then you haven't been, your case hasn't been filed against the judge, mm -hmm. that means that you could have disappeared anyway mm -hmm. from the point of your arrest. Like, you know, like people wouldn't be able to like have a trace of you so things like that happen so inside their own home they buy flour and then they do the three fingers salute with a flower 
but then they can't show their face, so they just take a picture of the three finger salute with a, a lot of the flower arrangement, and then they post it on social media as if, you know, this is like, you know, to the military. <laughs> um, one of the um, key things that have made this revolution strong is a, you've had 10 years of a, a movement towards democracy. So you've had people understanding democracy and learning about democracy and practicing democracy. Also, um, for 10 years, trade unions were legal and people um, learn about their rights and workers' rights and yeah. um, learn how to uh, practice actions to, to um, get better working conditions, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and also in terms of international developers, well, development as well, like um, there's been a lot of capacity building, say, for example, for women's organisations in, in the country and, and, and other different organisations. Mm. Um, I would also say that one of the benefits is that the Myanmar diaspora now is really strong all around the world. Mm. And that I think, I think that's a key thing, the diaspora being able to support from the outside now. Um, and also, <laughs> the thing is as well that the violence that is happening is not just happening in remote areas to one ethnicity or, or another, that it's happening all across Myanmar and every civilian is being affected and people are seeing now what the military is capable of. Mm, their eyes are so wide open yeah. now. Yeah. And I think also that is bringing about more empathy, just what you were talking about in terms of the Rohingya as well like people now understand because there was a lot of misinformation back then a lot of misinformation on social media um a lot of propaganda and people are just understanding now and it's been really interesting in when we've been in meetings and, and, and stuff like that or or training and this kind of thing and anecdotally some of the younger people are, are, are like they've said online like we're sorry and that's like so massive like that's just a reflection anyway. Yeah. We did run the campaign called We Are Ro. So Ro is short for Rohingya, like the, the Gen Z, they love, sh you know, anything <laughs> short. Um, so we run that we all are Ro, I am Ro, you are Ro, we are Ro. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone is a human being. Um, Myanmar junta ministers are still being invited to ASEAN meetings. So they're still engaging with them. It's it's really concerning, and so when Australia says, "Oh, we we encourage dialogue," mm. I'm very concerned about what what dialogue is actually happening. Yeah. Like it's enabling it's um, mm. enabling the junta. Mm. Mm. Great. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it sounds like there's much more that you could actually talk about. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, unfortunately, we're out of time now. So thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Don. Uh, thank you.